Well, excited to be here, excited to be speaking to you tonight. So much fun to see all your smiling faces. And the whole point is that this is a real blessing, that we don't have to fear disease, and we can take action to protect our health destiny, and we're in control of our lives. But, the, but my message tonight is to arm you with information so you can articulate the information and get greater knowledge to reach out and help other people that are suffering. My goal is to make to give you superpowers. To give you superpowers to really help humanity, help people in your communities, your loved ones, your friends, so they don't have the horrible tragedies happen to them, what happens to other Americans, and we can start changing America together. You know, because re really, I mean, what that are superpowers to like see through walls or bend steel or fly through the air? if we're not being invaded by aliens or fighting other people with superpowers. The real superpowers we need in this country today is so many people suffering with illnesses and diseases that are needless, that don't have to happen. And we've got to do something about it. There's no, because people are just, people are just, um, you know, tragically suffering needlessly. So I'll just give you an example. How many of you people out there in this group have been stabbed by a knife in their torso? Or how about your family that you stabbed by a knife in your torso or your neck or your... Nobody over here? How about how many of you either have been shot by a bullet or your friends or neighbors or family has been shot by a bullet? Raise your hand. About three people. And now let me ask you how many people have been, have either had a heart attack or a stroke or a cancer or a family member has had a heart attack or a stroke or a cancer? Raise your hand. Now my point is, that's a neighborhood, you've got to get out of that neighborhood, you've got to run from that neighborhood. Yeah. Don't go near there anymore, don't be part of it. Why are people not afraid, not doing anything about this? People are dropping dead every 10 seconds of these things that don't have to happen. It's so tragic. So we've got to know more about this. And this is what spurred me on to write this new book, Fast Food Genocide to see the genocide that's destroyed not just our bodies, but our brains. And that one in five Americans are now mentally ill. Whereas 100 years ago, it was one in 100 Americans were mentally ill. And people understand what elite causes obesity and diabetes and cancer, but they don't know it causes depression and schizophrenia and mental illness and loss of intelligence and loss of creativity and crime and violence and drug use and drug abuse, and that's what this is about. But before I get started, I want to give you some basic nutritional information so they can communicate better and give some foundational information about health and longevity, and then I'll move on to the subject at hand. Okay? So to get started, we're talking about right now the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan. Because I want you to be able to repeat this back to me and articulate it. So maybe you want to write this down. Because here's the question. What is the one foundational principle, what I, what I call a nutritarian diet, which is a diet that's rich in nutrients designed to prevent illnesses like autoimmune conditions, dementia, cancer, promote slower aging. What's the, found, the most important foundational principle of the nutritarian diet is the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan, enable people to live to be 100 years old. And that is, I'll say it, it's what? Calorie density, pretty close. Here's, here's what it is. Moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. You could say in your own words what, you, what um, was just said. But I want you to understand, because I'm giving you a little bit of the, my presentation tomorrow, which is going to talk about how slow aging and live to be 100 in great health. But I have to give you some foundational principles here today. And I have a little more time to talk tonight. So I can go through that a little, a little more detail. So what I'm saying to you is that the first principle of nutritarian diet has to do with nutrients. And there are two types of nutrients we're talking about. The first type is macronutrients. Fat, carbohydrate, and protein are macronutrients. Those are called macro, the word macro means big. And that what I'm saying right now is these macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein, they contain calories. And the more macronutrients or calories you consume through your lifetime, the shorter your life. You follow that? The more protein you eat, the shorter you live. 
the more fat you eat, the shorter you live, and the more carbohydrate you eat, the shorter you live. And Americans eat about a thousand calories a day too much. And I heard Anthony Lynn um, this morning say that it's now 70% of Americans that the, that the, um, that the National Institute of Health will determine are overweight or obese, but that's not true. Let me clarify that, okay? The only reason they classify 70% as being overweight or obese is because they use a BMI of 25 as a demarcation line. That means above 25 are considered overweight or obese. We look at the blue zone, long-lived societies free of heart disease and strokes, societies that have most centenarians, all those peoples have BMIs below 23, not below 25. If we use 23 as the demarcation line, instead of using 25 as the demarcation line, now we find that 89% of Americans are overweight or obese, not 70%. Did you follow that? Yes. Now let's just take a brief look at the 11% of those Americans that are considered a normal weight with a BMI below 23. And we find that 9% of that 11%, 9 of that 11 or what 90% of those people are in normal weight because they're sick. They're alcoholics, they have depression, they're cigarette smokers, they have autoimmune conditions, they're called cancers, digestive disorders, and there's some, you know, asthmatics, there's some medical reason why their weight is not overweight. The majority of normal weight people in America are sick. So if you analyze the health of normal weight Americans, you're going to find they're sicker than overweight Americans. It's only 2.4% of Americans are a normal weight because they eat right and exercise. Did you follow that? So what I'm saying here is Americans are eating a huge amount of calories too much. And of course, at the same time, they're eating calories that don't contain antioxidants and phytochemicals. In other words, micronutrients are those food components that do not contain calories, that are essential for normal immune function, that protect us against cancer, protect us against inflammation, protect us against disease, and we need a, a large amount, but also the full symphony orchestra of all those micronutrients we need for our good health. We have a comprehensive array of these micronutrients, and the American population is ubiquitously so, as severely deficient in micronutrients while they're overeating macronutrients. So that's what we're talking about here. And of course, my health equation represents this mathematically with a few basic symbols, H equals N over C, which means your healthy life expectancy, how long you're gonna live, and the quality of your life in your later years is proportional to the nutrient density of your calories all through life. That means that as you eat empty calorie foods, like bread and pasta and salad oil, mayonnaise and donuts and cookies and crackers and rice cakes and bread and and chips and soft drinks and candy, as you start to eat those foods, every pizza and bagel and croissant that you eat, you shorten your lifespan. Because you're throwing in calories with no nutrients associated with them. It also means that we have to, that nutrients matter and the calories we eat are important. It's funny, I was just commenting earlier um, to Mark as he was interviewing me, I was saying that when I brought my daughter, Kara, when she was four years old, to a health club, to a, the health club, right, exercise, and she came out of this class she took, and she said, don't these parents love their children? And I said, of course they do. And she said, well, why are they feeding them like cheese doodles and all kinds of junk and candy and to hurt their bodies, hurt their brains? And I said, well, they don't know what we know. So she looked at me and said, how could they be so stupid? How could they, and she said to me, how could they not know that what you put in your mouth and what you eat makes who you are, makes your body? My children could never figure out how the rest of the world was so confused they couldn't figure out that what you ate became the person you are that made you. And what I'm saying to you right now is people, for some reason, are divorced from reality. Most of you are, actually. You think that, you know, in other words, if you smoke cigarettes two packs a day for 10 or 20 years, then you stop. It's sure better that you quit smoking, of course. But you're not going to have, you know, the more you're away from those cigarettes, the healthier you're going to be. But you're going to pay a price forever for those 20 years of smoking cigarettes. You don't, you can't escape from these biological laws of cause and effect. You're, you're, so this says that your life expectancy is proportional to the overall lifetime exposure, the nutrient density of your diet, the quality of the foods you put in your mouth for your whole life. Are you following this? Every biteful matters. You don't get a free ride. 
You can't go out and have pizza and croissants and eat junk food and expect not to pay a price. It matters. And it's up to you. It's your body. Who's going to take care of you if it's not you? So do you understand this? The first principle we're talking about here? We can move on. The standard American diet, of course, the SAD or the DAD, the deadly American diet, is more than half of those processed foods that do not contain any significant micronutrient loads. And many people are aware that one-third of animal products in the American diet, one-third of... What's the matter with this thing? It's working before. Maybe it needs a new battery. Maybe I need a new battery. <laughs> so here's the point, is that animal products do not contain a significant load of micronutrients either. They're rich in macronutrients. They're very concentrated calories, but they don't contain any phytochemicals, no antioxidants, and their vitamin and mineral load is almost insignificant. They're a rich, concentrated source of calories. What I'm saying to you right now is a piece of chicken is just like a bagel. So my, why am I saying a piece of chicken is like a bagel? Right. No significant diet. They don't have the micronutrients. The real money is in the vegetables and the plants that, that we're not eating. And every and of course it says here that we're eating about 11% of calories in natural plants, but the government includes um, french fries and white mashed potato and ketchup and those other things that really aren't vegetables. It's about 5% of uh, colorful plant foods in the American diet, whereas all blue zones, all the populations have a diet with at least 90% of unrefined plant food. There's no longer population that doesn't eat at least 90% of unrefined plant food in their diet, and we need 5%. You follow that? This diet could be better designed had it been created by ISIS. <laughs> and I just want to say that on my own behalf, when I said that joke on PBS, on television, I said, this diet's been designed by Al-Qaeda, Al and PBS cut it out, and it has me on TV saying, this, and I didn't say this, this diet's been designed by Darth Vader. That is such a bad joke. Yeah. Just don't blame me for that. It wasn't me saying that. They were taking my, taking out and twisting it. Most of my jokes they took out, especially when I was talking about Cookie Monster changing his diet. Oh. <laughs> touch that. <laughs> but we're talking about the standard diet is bad enough. It's bad enough with all these processed and junk foods and so much overeating calories. Let me just give you an example here for a minute of how these processed foods lead to overeating. Because we know if you get a little bit of excess calories, you shorten your life. And we can talk about that tomorrow. We can just a little bit of excess calories shortens your life. <coughs> Let's say you, you people in this part of the world. I'm going to set up a buffet right here in the front. You're going to line up to get your food at the buffet. And we're going to have these scientists weigh your, weigh your plates and track how much you eat, the exact amount of food and calories you consume. But on, as you're waiting to get the food in line, I'm going to hand every one of you an apple to eat as you're waiting in line to fill up your plates. And then the scientists will find that on the average, you generally ate about 65 calories less of the food on the buffet when you took in that 65 calorie apple because it ratcheted down the apple stat by the amount of calories in the apple. Pretty straightforward. Now on this side of the room, of course, instead of giving you that apple, it would give you a tablespoon of olive oil with 120 calories to eat while you're waiting in line to fill your plates. And now the scientists, but because that olive oil is absorbed in three to five minutes into your bloodstream, all that 120 calories comes right into the bloodstream with no fiber, no bulk, and no significant micronutrient load to turn down the apostat. Because the apostat is affected by micronutrients, water content, fiber, bulk, all these things affect your, and so there's no, so oil does not shut down the apostat, so they'll find that you consumed 120 calories more. In other words, you didn't reduce your, what you picked up here on the buffet as a result of having that oil. You following that? It's just 120 calories extra they put in the body. But now, instead of giving you the oil on your in line, what if I mix the oil in the food and I mix the, in the salad or the vegetables, right? Have the, the oil mixed in. Then what would happen? Right? You'd eat more food 
than the 120 calories in the oil. The oil would induce eating more food on the buffet and more food in general, so now you would have increased your caloric intake by 220 calories on the average, not 120 calories. Did you follow that? Yeah. You see, we're talking about here how fast calories enter the bloodstream. Now when I talk about fast food or processed foods, we're talking about foods that can be accessed fast. You don't have to just open the bag and eat it. You can buy them at a fast food restaurant or a convenience store, but, but you also they're digested very rapidly. And because the calories flood into the bloodstream so rapidly, they don't only not shut down the appetite, they stimulate biological mechanisms that make you want to keep eating more and more food. And so they increase your caloric drive tremendously. So, so fast food has six characteristics. It's digested and absorbed rapidly, multiple synthetic ingredients, it's calorically dense, it's nutritionally barren, it's high in flavor, it's high in sugar and salt. It has all those cal characteristics to accelerate aging and create disease. So the word glycemic load has to do with the carbohydrate content of that food because the carbohydrate is broken down into simple sugars, enters the bloodstream as glucose. And what gives a food a high glycemic load has to do with not how much glucose enters the bloodstream, but how rapidly the glucose enters the bloodstream. So overall, a food that has a high glycemic load means all that glucose in that food enters the bloodstream in that first hour after you ate the food. Whereas if you have, I gave you a bean or something like a with 200 calories, it's going to enter the bloodstream so slowly over three hours, like one or two calories a minute, not requiring much of an insulin response in response to those calories. So it's called a low glycemic carbohydrate food. Now, high glycemic carbohydrate foods demand from the pancreas it secrete a huge amount of insulin. So an explosion of insulin is produced to get the sugar out of the blood. And even though the sugar leaves the bloodstream relatively quickly, in a few hours, the insulin doesn't leave the bloodstream quickly. It stays there a long time. Insulin is a fat-promoting, growth-promoting hormone. It promotes angiogenesis, and it promotes cellular replication, meaning it promotes cancer. Do you know what the word angiogenesis means, most of you? You're shaking your head yes? What does it mean? Right, it means it's, it promotes the growth of new blood vessels. So blood vessels sprout new tubules and new growth, like a tree growing in the, in the springtime. You know, so it, it helps. In other words, fat cells are living tissue. They need oxygen and nourishment and nutrients. They can't grow. You can't get fat on your body unless new blood vessels grow to feed the fat cells and allow them to grow. And insulin promotes the growth of those blood vessels which is, would permit fat, new fat to grow on the body. Can you follow that now? Insulin causes the fat cells to swell, it causes cells to replicate and grow, and it causes your blood vessels to grow in the process. It also promotes the growth of cancer, and atherosclerosis, and aging of the brain, and insulin is one of those hormones that shortens your lifespan. So we're talking here about the danger of having high glycemic carbohydrates because these high glycemic load carbohydrates, which necessitate a higher production of insulin, is linked to heart disease, cancer, macular degeneration, gallbladder disease, and dementia. And the flood of sugar entering the bloodstream, that rapid flood of sugar entering the bloodstream, causes damage to brain cells, and you lose functioning brain cells, leading to lower intelligence every time you eat a high glycemic food, like a donut or a pint of ice cream. Right? And because the, the calories in the bloodstream so rapidly, they also spike dopamine release in the brain, which makes it impossible to just have a couple of tablespoons of that ice cream. You've you got to finish the whole bite. It's like you can't eat that potato chip, you can't eat the whole bag. Right? And food, and food scientists designed these frankenfoods to, to, to um, disenable our, to be able to our ability to stop eating them. They, they incite our ability to want to keep eating and keep eating. They're highly addictive, and they encourage people to overeat. So we're talking here about the combination between these fast foods. Maybe I should switch quicker. Just stop working. If you don't mind, can I, can I, 
you guys know my way in a second. I have my own clicker. <laughs> Happens to be the same clicker. You may even just work without any changing them. So, uh, color of this. Too. So, giving white rice as an example, the link between the Asian country between white rice and diabetes, high white rice intake, there's the high glycemic carbohydrate, dramatically increases diabetes, and of course, um, replacing white rice with brown rice is somewhat effective at reducing diabetes risk. Of course, we know now in this country that the brown rice is contaminated and polluted with arsenic. And it's a dangerous food that can lead to dementia and cancer because brown rice is now contaminated, even organic brown rice. The link between white rice and glycemic effect in breast cancer, um, every 100 grams a day increased breast cancers by 19%, and high glycemic foods are associated with other cancers, especially in other studies, especially among overweight women, because obviously the more overweight you are, the more insulin resistant you become. So my body at this body weight might require 15 units of insulin a day, but if I put on 20 pounds, I was requiring 15 units a day, I might require 30 or 50 units a day. If I put on 40, 50 pounds, I may require over 100 units of insulin a day. You become your, so now, when you're eating a high glycemic food, you're producing a 10 times as much insulin, 10 times as much risk of cancer when you're overweight, and when you're overweight, the fat cells also produce angiogenesis promoting hormones to promote cancer, and fat cells produce estrogen, and estrogen increases the risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer, and those hormones are powerfully cancer promoting. So when you put fat on your body, you are automatically accelerating the height and production of these dangerous hormones, and accelerating the glycemic effect of foods, and white, using white rice as an example, a high glycemic load of food. Here's an analysis of 39 studies showing that the glycemic load and glycemic index is associated with colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, and of course, prostate and breast cancer as well. In general, in general, we're talking here, the general idea is that things that are white are absorbed very rapidly. You don't eat white bread, and white pasta, you don't smoke, you don't smoke cocaine, you know, sort of white heroin, and none of those things. The white of the bread, the sooner you're dead. Don't trust things that are too white. No laughing. Don't forget, smiling and laughing increases your lifespan. It's a good one. And the joke doesn't have to be funny. You just have to smile and laugh anyway. It's the laughing and smiling, that's good. Do it anyway. You're good. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. <laughs> What's that? Are you gonna say that? Are you gonna say that? Is that margin? Yeah. What are you doing here? <laughs> what did you say, by the way? Are you going to sing that? Sing, sing, that. sing, sing that. it. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> Maybe I'll wrap it. If you come up here and sing it with me, I'll do it. You should do your singing here. Okay, the foods with the strongest link to cancer, of course, are processed meats and barbecue and, and dairy products are associated very closely with prostate and breast cancer, fried foods. People say, well, what about just moderation? Just have it once in a while. Well, what's the increased risk of breast cancer from having some of these foods in moderation? What if you had one serving of french fries a week? How would that increase risk of breast cancer? 26% increased breast cancer in one serving a week. What about two servings a week? Just two servings a week of commercial baked goods and depression. One cookie and one croissant or one french fries and one bagel. Just two servings a week. Doubles your risk of developing depression. Just two servings a week. The moderate use of these foods are exceedingly dangerous. And of course, the carcinogens and fast foods and processed foods, like the n nitrosamino compounds and the polyaromatic hydrocarbons and the heterocyclic amines, 
and of course we're talking at the bottom of the sea of arsenic and rice, the World Health Organization has classified these red meats and processed meats and barbecue, the things you get in food, fast food restaurants, which are fried and grilled and flame, bro flame broiled and overly cooked, are classified as a group, a group A class one carcinogen, which means they're not a probable carcinogen, they're a strong and definitive carcinogenic substance that people are consuming all around us up and down the streets. Right? If you're putting in carcinogenic substances right in the body, in spite of the fact that it's not even controversial anymore. So fast food and slow food has to do with the caloric or how fast these calories enter the bloodstream. An example of hot calories into the bloodstream rapidly are things like white flour products like bread and candy. There's no real difference between eating a marshmallow and a piece of white bread or a pizza. It's the same thing. It enters the bloodstream as a flood of glucose. And of oil, of course, an example of the slow food in comparison would be things like beans and nuts. Because had you eaten those beans, beans are the foods with the highest amount of slowly digestible carbohydrates whose glucose is released very slowly over a period of hours, not minutes. And nuts and seeds have fats that are bound to the sterols and stanols and fibers that take three to four hours for those fat calories to enter the bloodstream. So when fat calories enter the bloodstream so slowly, they're preferentially burned as energy as opposed to being stored as fat. Plus, the sterols and stanols, the fibers and nuts and seeds, bind the fat so tightly that they carry fat out into the toilet bowl, making all the fat calories in nuts and seeds not absorbable. So not only did you, when you ate the nuts and seeds, not only did you uh, coming up to the buffet or on the buffet, not only would you not eat those extra calories, but you actually would get less calories than you think you're eating. So when you feel satiated, they ratcheted down that apostat extra amount but then all those calories never came into you because they, a, a percent of those calories passed through you not being absorbed. Did you follow that? Mm -hmm. Likewise with beans. Beans not only have very slowly digestible starches, but they're very rich in resistant starches. And those resistant starches are not susceptible to enzymatic degradation, which means that they are broken down by bacteria and the carbohydrate is turned into fat. But it happens so far down in the digestive tract that the calories are lost and the fat passes through you into the toilet bowl. So all the calories and beans are also not digestible and absorbable. So you feel like you're eating those 200 calories. You stopped eating because you felt satiated from those 200 calories. It ratcheted down the apple stack by 200 calories, but you didn't get in 200 calories. So you naturally and moderately caloric restricted just by adding raw vegetables and greens and nuts and beans in your meal. Naturally, but you took in less calories than you thought you did. Now, this says that since 1909, soybean oil use has increased a thousand fold in this country. Our oil consumption has increased about 50 fold, but soybean oil consumption has increased more than a thousand times. And fast foods are high in these omega 6 oils, and even moderate use is incredibly carcinogenic. Even people who work in fast food restaurants and don't even eat the food, just inhale the fumes off the fryers, have an increased risk of cancer. Just living in an atmosphere increases the risk of cancer. <coughs> the fumes are so carcinogenic, even if it causes cancer just to work in a, in a movie theater with the oil they cook the popcorn in. So we build up these toxic metabolites from these toxic processed foods like free radicals, advanced glycation end products, cross-linking agents, lipofusion. I'm so sorry. technical difficulties here. Okay, getting back to what we were talking about here. We build up these toxic metabolites, right? And we and the one we're talking about a lot today and tomorrow are advanced glycation end products. From the high sugar going into the bloodstream, we produce glucose moieties on our proteins, on our body proteins, which age us. It says advanced glycation end products, 
A-G-E, A-G-E is the abbreviation, it says ages us, it ages us. That's also, the abbreviation is age. You can remember it, bad glycation end products. And the more processed carbohydrate you eat, the more high glycemic foods you eat, the more junk food you eat, the more these build up, actually you're diabetic, you have higher circulating glucose all the time, you have excess production of insulin, high levels of insulin, that combination makes people develop macular degeneration, kidney failure, nerve damage in their legs, and what causes the nerve damage in their leg and the kidney failure and the damage to their eyes, what damages it? The buildup of AGEs, of advanced glycation end products is the primary factor causing that increased morbidity and mortality, destroying the brain and the body and the diabetics. We build up a lot of these toxic agents, and we eat a lot of animal protein. We build up more ammonia, which is exceedingly toxic to the brain. The body has to convert that ammonia into urea and uric acid, which are toxins. The, kidney, the liver has to process the ammonia into urea and uric acid, so the kidney can excrete it and get rid of it out of the body. And these toxins build up, which put more stress on the liver and the kidney. Especially, and the, the body's dealing with these toxins in the, more effectively when we're not eating. Right, when you finish digesting the meal, the body can most the liver can devote its energies to removing the excess proteins and getting rid of all the ammonia that is produced and trying to excrete that more readily. And of course, the excess animal products we eat cause the bacteria to build up in our digestive tract. And these bad these bacteria that live in the digestive tract, especially when you eat sweets and meats, when you eat white flour products and high glycemic carbohydrates and animal products. We build up bacteria that produce poisonous byproducts, like TMAO, or trimethylamine oxide, which actually causes inflammation in the brain, increasing risk of dementia. And TMAO also makes you more insulin resistant. So now when you eat that mango, you produce a huge amount of insulin because you have certainly TMAO because you regularly ate meat. When you're a meat eater, every carbohydrate you eat becomes more dangerous. So if you really want to kill people, you can put carbohydrates together with meat, like a burger, or pizza, stuff like that, or macaroni and cheese, or ham and cheese, or spaghetti and meatballs in our American diet. So what I'm saying right now is it's not merely the, the processed foods and the carbohydrates, but also we eat so much animal protein and Animal protein is different biologically than plant protein because we give more credence to studies that go on for decades with large numbers of people and look at hard endpoints like death as opposed to a soft endpoint like weight loss or triglycerides. What I'm saying right now is let's look at a few of those studies. But the point I'm making here is that I want you to understand some of these mechanisms via which when you get your protein from plants, how it's so different biologically from getting your protein from animal products. It's a horse of a different color. Here's an example, a study on 6,000 people, and these people were between the ages of 50 and 65, and they followed them for 18 years, and those who, and they developed, and they broke down the amount of animal protein they ate into three groups. Those that ate the top third had a fourfold increase in cancer death over that 18 year period compared to people in the lowest third. In the top third, they were eating more than 30% of calories from animal product, the same amount that Americans eat. In the middle third, it was between 10 and 30%, and the lower third was less than 10%, and low, compared those who were eating less than 10% of calories from animal products to more than 30%, they saw that fourfold increase in death from cancer and a 75% increase in overall death rate. Well, mine isn't working either. This is really weird. All right, let's go on. And so I'm trying to describe to you somewhat of the difference when you eat high protein plants like hemp seeds and sunflower seeds and green vegetables like broccoli is 45% protein, and you know, and some natural plants like beans are 30% protein, 28 to 33% protein. But let's look at a bean. If I'm telling you a bean's like 30% protein, and I already told you earlier that part of the carbohydrate bean is not biologically absorbable to the body, it passes through to the toilet bowl. That means the actual percent of the bean calories that are absorbed is really protein. It's close to 35 or 40 percent, like the broccoli was. 
These plant foods are high protein plant foods. But why do the high, when they, yet the burger only has 30% protein. Why do the higher protein plant foods do not raise the hormones IGF-1, do not cause the bacteria buildup of TMAO, do not cause the inflammation states? Do, what, why do we have a different biological effect on eating animal protein versus plant protein, even it's a lot of protein? The point I'm making right now is our goal is to eat more plant protein, to get our protein from plants, not from animal products, because it's a completely different biological effect. Like when you take your sugar from a bean instead of from a piece of white bread, a different biological effect. See, when we eat nuts and seeds and greens and beans for our sources of protein, those proteins are not biologically complete. And because they're not biologically complete, they enter the bloodstream slowly in a form that can't be utilized immediately. And then the body makes them biologically complete in the amount it needs to, to make the hormones it needs, and, and to build muscle as the, as the demands are placed on it. In other words, you need a certain amount of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one for good health. An excess amount is what's gonna age you, shorten your lifespan and, and increase risk of cancer, but you'll get just the right amount, not too little or not too much, if your diet is high in, in these high-protein plants, because the body can store these amino acids, mix them together to complete them. It can even absorb the bacteria in the digestive tract as it needs to to complete the protein, but it'll only absorb the bacteria and digest the bacteria in the digestive tract as food as it needs to to biologically complete the protein just enough to maintain the level of hormone that you need that's optimal without overshooting it too much. Which you take in the animal protein, all these proteins that are already biologically complete rush into the bloodstream in high amounts, and the body can't control the amount of, of hormone it makes, so it overshoots and makes too much hormone, which can promote too much angiogenesis, and too much inflammation, and too much growth, promoting the growth of cancer and aging of the brain and aging you in general. Follow this? See, in nature, in the natural world, the ability, the reproductive ability of animals and their lifespan is modulated by their protein intake. Why is that? Why is that? Why is protein the primary modulator of how long an animal lives? Let me explain this for a minute, okay? Because let's say we're look, looking here at the, the Canadian lynx and the snowshoe and the snowshoe hare, which is a rabbit that lives off of three lives off of vegetables, and then the, the cats, these lynx, eat the rabbits. Now what if the lynx really are getting into a great job and enjoy eating more rabbits? They eat a little extra there are a lot, they start eating a lot of the rabbits. What's happening to the rabbits? They're going to die off. They're going to become extinct if the, the lynx eat too many rabbits. And then the lynx will eventually become extinct because there wouldn't be enough rabbits to feed their offspring. So nature that has, a, has a relationship between predator and prey where if the predator starts to eat too much of the prey, the extra protein shortens the lifespan of the predator so he doesn't consume too much of the prey. So, the prey, so there's enough prey for other predators and other, so they don't become extinct. So both species do not become extinct. Matter of fact, it's worked in nature where the extra IGF-1, the extra animal protein, even in a carnivore, by the way, even when a carnivore overeats protein, it not only shortens its own life and shortens its own reproductive abilities, but it also shortens the life of its children and grandchildren. Because nature needs to shorten the life of the offspring when, when, the, when the parents eat unhealthily, because if it didn't, it wouldn't give the prey animal a chance to reproduce its species and come back from being decimated by the overeating of the, of the predators. Are you following that? Yeah. And we're predators when we eat foods in plastic bags in the supermarkets. You follow me? The body doesn't differentiate. It's shortening our lifespan, thinking we're overeating in prey, prey, and it shortens the lifespan of our children. This is what people don't recognize that when you eat food, you're not just affecting your own health, you're affecting the health of future generations. So you, you're, you're living protecting the eggs that are in your body that were born in you, if you're a woman, right? So you are, when, you are, when your child is born at 25 years old, how old are they, really? When they're born, and you have this child at 25, that child's really 50 years old. They're not 25 years old because they're actually 51 years old because the egg was formed and then a hair and nail was formed in the first, the 
first six weeks of life, it was six to 12 weeks of life, you're forming the eggs of your future child, so the eggs are really made eight months, seven to eight months before you actually give birth. So your child's going to, at the age of 25, that, that um, egg has been around for 25 plus eight months, almost 29, only, almost 51 years, and the diet you ate as a child and a teenager and in your 20s affected the health of your child. So when you ate those barbecue ribs and the hot dogs, and the pastrami sandwiches. Now maybe you're gonna have a child with a brain tumor or with can a child with cancer or an autoimmune disease. And the link here with what I'm saying between processed meats and, and child with cancer and brain tumors is solid. And the link between processed meats and autism, and so we're saying right now that you're you're affecting the health of future generations. It's important for our children to eat healthy for their own health. And for, their, and for their children's health as well. And we know right now is that the American health authorities advocating people take folic acid is the same thing as taking a blood pressure medication instead of eating healthy. A cholesterol lowering drug. They're given folic acid instead of eating high folate plant foods. So now they don't have to eat green vegetables because they can just take their folic acid pill. But folic acid is a synthetic substance made from petroleum that increases risk of breast and prostate cancer with a very powerful effect. And mothers who take folic acid increase the risk of breast cancer and autism and mental disorders and, and learning disabilities in their children. Because it's not only the lack of real folate, but all the other protective vegetable nutrients in green vegetables. What I'm saying right now is green vegetable consumption during pregnancy and prior to conception throughout life has been shown to be protected against having children with cancer, with autoimmune conditions, with autism, and with brain tumors. So instead of teaching our population how to prevent these diseases, we give them a pill solution so they don't have to think about eating healthy. You following this? Our medical authorities live with this fast food mentality. Now salt, I'm just, we're talking here about fast food and how heavily salted fast foods are too, and I might as well throw into the mix that there are two types of strokes. There's hemorrhagic strokes and embolic or ischemic strokes. Shoot, this is really cramping my style here. <laughs> you get closer to the computer? Closer to the computer, let me see. Is that going to do it? Okay. Maybe that's going to look better. I'll try that. Thank you, Mark. What's that? So here's the point. Is we know that, that the embolic stroke is formed by a clot that can travel to the brain or a clot formed in the brain. The clots are the primary cause of heart attacks as well. And that's the most common type of stroke. And the more you eat burgers and bacon and cheese and American diet, you have increased risk of this embolic or ischemic stroke. But the other type of stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke. That's where the blood vessel gets irritated and inflamed and it gets cracks and breaks and blood bleeds into the brain. It's a much more massive stroke, can be more devastating, cause death or for paralysis and put you in a nurse for the rest of your life. And what I'm saying right now is this, this hemorrhagic stroke is more common in populations that have a lower cholesterol level. And the embolic stroke is more common in populations that have a higher cholesterol level. For example, in Asian countries where they don't eat many meat and bacon and cheese, have very low rates of embolic or ischemic stroke with very high rates of hemorrhagic stroke from all the salt they consume. And as your diet becomes more cardiovascular protective with lower cholesterol levels with a better diet, it becomes more susceptible to hemorrhagic strokes because the process that forms atherosclerosis actually thickens the blood vessels in the brain, causing them to be a little more durable to prevent them from rupturing and fracturing and causing a hemorrhagic stroke. Now salt doesn't just cause strokes from raising blood pressure. The chronic use of salt over the years causes microvascular hemorrhaging, which means little irritations and damage, constant little cuts, little pinpoint cuts and irritations, inflaming the interior wall of your blood vessel, weakening the endothelium, the interior wall of the blood vessel, putting you at higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So if you're on a let's say a vegan type diet or a near vegan diet where you're going to have low risk of heart disease, you could be increasing your risk of stroke over the heavy meat eater. 
Did you follow that? Because you still salt your food. We don't want people on plant-based diets to, to change their method of death. We want them to wipe out both types of strokes. And the only way to do that is by not just not eating the junk, but also not putting the salt on your food as well. Any questions on that? Now you know that addiction has these two characteristics. One is that high people get that want to keep imbibing, they want to keep smoking, they feel good when they smoke, they feel good when they eat the donut, they feel good when they snort the cocaine. Something happens to them that they like that feeling, and the feeling comes in, that high dopamine surge comes in from eating foods that are digested very rapidly, and absorb a lot of calories flood the bloodstream very rapidly, you get the same dopamine response as if, if, if you started cocaine or taking narcotics. It's, in the brain, there's no difference. It's the same, and you want to just reproduce those feelings, and you don't even know what's happening, why your car wants to go to Dunkin' Donuts or the cancer, or, you know, or pizza, cut, pizza King, whatever it's called. But the second part of addiction, besides just feeling good and wanting to keep doing it and buying it, is the feeling of, of pain and discomfort that occurs when you try to stop. Because when you stop smoking cigarettes, you feel so uncomfortable, you just want to go out and have that cigarette. When you stop drinking coffee, you have the headaches and the shakiness. If you stop the cocaine or the opiates, you're itching, you're irritable, you just can't stand the way you feel and you don't want to have it, you want to stop the pain. And that same detoxification and withdrawal occurs when you eat poorly because then you have the headaches, the weakness, the stomach cramping, the esophageal the spasm, the growling stomach, the anxiety, the moodiness, the depressed mentality, the loss of concentration. All these things happen when you stop imbibing in junk food. And the worse your diet is, the more discomfort and the more uncomfortable you feel when you try to stop eating and stop eating junk food. So what I'm saying right now is that there are two phases to the digestive cycle. There's the anabolic phase, the word anabolic means to build. And the anabolic phase is when you're eating and digesting food. So that's going on while you're eating and digesting. And when you're eating and digesting, the liver is busy absorbing calories and stuck and turning into glycogen and, and processing food. It's not in a detox phase, it's in a it's in an absorption and storage phase. But then when you stop digesting and you stop eating, it's over with, you finish, that's when the body and the liver and the rest of the body most effectively can heal and repair and detoxify. And that's when the ill feelings start in the burn off, the catabolic phase, you're not eating. So we want to live in that catabolic phase. We want to give the body more chance to, feed, to, to do what it has to do, to do its, to process toxins. And the glucose curve goes up. And then as soon as you enter the catabolic phase and you stop and the glucose is all absorbed or stored away, then we're in the detox phase. Most people eating conventional foods feel so ill in the detox phase and they start to feel, and if they enter the beginning of it, they start to feel shaky and weak. And they feel, they think that's hunger. And they're forced to eat food when there's no biological demand for calories. The body didn't burn off the calories that were stored yet, it just finished absorbing them. It's like filling a car with gasoline, and you drive it around the block, one block, and you go to another gas station to fill it back up again. The people gotta keep putting food into it. Because they don't like the way they feel when they enter the beginning of the catabolic phase, they start to feel shaky and weak. That's not hunger, that's withdrawal or detoxification. And the longer you stay in that catabolic phase, the longer your body's healing and detoxing. True hunger wood doesn't really occur until hours and hours after eating is finished. And a, a couple of hours of detox have occurred. And by the way, in that catabolic phase, when you're burning mostly the glycogen that's been stored in the liver and muscle tissue, and you really don't burn a lot of fat off your body, until perhaps three quarters of the, two thirds or three quarters of the glycogen has been utilized. So it's only the later half of the catabolic phase where you're really actually getting into your fat stores and losing weight. If you keep eating again, or if you keep burning off a little bit of glycogen and eat again, burning off a little bit of glycogen and eat again, you're never gonna lose any weight. You're just gonna keep gaining weight because you're eating too frequently and too much. Most Americans go from one, they go from one anabolic phase to another anabolic phase, keep putting food in. I always tell people, the longer you live in the catabolic phase, the longer you live. Do you understand that one? I mean, 
mean, we know that what's related to longevity is finishing eating dinner early, so the bigger catabolic window at night of 13 or 14 hours and no food coming in slows aging and extends lifespan. We're talk, I'm talking about it about tomorrow, how to slow aging and extend lifespan. One of the ways is living more in the catabolic phase. Because most people are taught, eat frequently, keep eating short, small meals, eat all day long, keep the food coming in. They have to keep the food coming in. They don't, because they're an addict. The addict has to chain smoke. The addict has to chain eat. You can't escape these biological drives if you're eating an unhealthy diet because the desire to chain eat is too powerful. So real hunger, when you're healthy, you naturally desire less calories. Remember when I started this presentation? I said the most proven methodology to slow aging, extend lifespan, is what? Moderate caloric restriction, right? In an environment of micronutrients. But you know, the opposite is true. That when you have micronutrient excellence, you naturally and automatically desire less calories. You understand that? If you're not going to focus on the quality of your diet, you, you can't call desire to overeat. It's impossible. You have to eat a healthy enough diet to want to eat to, so your body doesn't desire so many calories. So real hunger, of course, sensation in your throat, it makes food taste great, it's associated with an increased, dramatically heightened taste sensation. And so if somebody came up to me and said, hey, Joel, I made this incredible soup, you've got to taste it. So you guys, so I said, it's really healthy, you're gonna love it. And I'll say, oh, well, thanks so much. But let me put it in the refrigerator for now. When I get hungry, I'll eat it, I'll enjoy it more. I want to eat it now. I just finished it eating my lunch, maybe, or my breakfast a few hours. I wait till I'm hungry, when I'll enjoy it more. You don't feel like eating when you're not hungry, when you're eating a healthy diet. The healthier you eat, the less calories you require in your catabolic phase, and you prefer not to eat until you really get hungry again. So the point here is, is that in order to get slim and healthy and not overeat, you have to get rid of toxic, be healthy enough to get rid of toxic hunger. So that's why diets of all description don't work because people don't focus on eating a high volume, high nutrient foods. They don't focus on quality. And of course we have to avoid the animal protein. Maybe it's maybe the position is higher or something. So we have to avoid the animal protein, the sugar, the caffeine, then the feed toxic hunger because too much of the caffeine and the animal protein. We know the animal protein causes the ammonia in the brain, which then causes people to feel hypoglycemia. What's hypoglycemia? That's a person on a toxic diet who's withdrawing from their excess protein that needs to keep chain eating protein so they don't feel ill. It's like chain smoking. It's not, it's just they're detoxing from their excess protein. They think they need more protein because it's suppressing the detoxification of the protein. You following that? Mm -hmm. the, the brain is under attack because these fried foods and commercial baked goods are linked to depression, but those people who eat baked goods and processed fr fried foods and fried squid and fried burgers and fried corn muffins or whatever they fry, they fry butter and they put a dip of the butter into corn flour, they fry that, they fry anything. <laughs> you take those little um, plastic packing material and you could dip that in like <laughs> oil and salt and cornmeal and flour and fry that and people will eat, I'm sure. <laughs> but in any case, the point I'm making right now is just because these foods are linked to major depression and half the people develop major depression, in other words, there are two servings a week, 50% increase risk of major depression. And it goes up from there, more servings in a dose-dependent manner. Three servings, more than that. Four servings, 20 servings, goes up higher and higher. But those people that don't get depressed from those foods, it's still affecting their brain function. They're still putting a cloud over their thinking. They're still moderately depressed. They're still sadder. They're still not enthusiastic about their life. There's, it's still causing minor depression, even in people who aren't depressed from those foods. You find that it's affecting the cognition, the creativity, the enthusiasm, and everybody's happiness that eats these foods. It's taking away their desire for happiness because that's what addictions do. That's because addicts live now for stimulation and they body, their, their instinctual drives now are more important about fueling their addictive behaviors that they can't quit more than anything else in their life. 
They no longer care about their family, about having goodwill for humanity, being creative, being productive. Right? Their, their primary motivation now for living is feeding and fueling their addiction. And of course, the addict wants to go with the delusional rationalizations. Well, it's too stressful right now for me to quit smoking. They're not going to change my diet right now, or I'll worry about when I'm older, or blah, 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 blah. They have somebody, or I'm too busy, or my, to my work schedule, or I travel too much, or my friends won't do it, or they one list after another, why well, it's not the right time, but it's too hard for them to do it because the addictive, your brain is no longer yours. You've lost the keys to the bank. Your decision making is taken over by your addiction. The primitive brain is driving your thinking, and the brain now is in the public. Any kind of irrational reason it can to maintain its addictive state. Did you follow that? You've lost your intelligence now, and you're no longer in control. The addictions are controlling you. The subconscious mind is fighting against what you're hearing this weekend. You may be saying, this sounds great, scientific, logical, everything else, but this part of you is thinking, of, well, how can I avoid doing this? Oh, I know, this sounds great, but, I'm, but I might as well just enjoy my life more and live shorter anyway, because I'll have more fun in my life, do what I mean, what I want to eat, right? That's a delusional, irrational self-talking. It's not true. You get like you're used to eating, you're not enjoying your life more. You're in a prison. You're enjoying your life less. And you know what? You can't be a good mother, a good daughter, a good father, a good son. You can't be good to other people. You can't be the full you. You can't achieve what you want to achieve in life. You can't have that full ability to reach out and be and and and, and care about people as much when you're an addict. Because when you're an addict, those things don't matter. It's getting to the drive-in and having your Dunkin' Donuts. That's all that matters. All that matters is feeding your face. And of course, you're losing your intelligence. The more you eat these processed foods and fast foods, the more you lose brain function. You keep eating them, you lose more brain function and more brain function. Keep eating them, you need more. You keep losing more and more brain cells and brain cells and brain cells until you become president. <laughs> I, couldn't, I, said, I shouldn't tell that joke. <laughs> so here's a study that I published in the American Journal called Nutrition Journal called the Change Perception of Hunger on a High Nutrient Intensity Diet. It showed that people had less hunger, less desire to overeat. And the perception of hunger changed from being felt in the stomach and the head, went to the throat, and people just naturally desired less calories, just we increased the nutrient intensity of their diet. And here's a study published in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine on a nutritarian diet, showing that the average person lost 50 pounds in the first year and continued to lose more weight in year two and year three. What makes this so unique is that there's no studies that not only cause that much weight loss, but no studies that show that people don't regain most of the weight they lost. Yet in this group, they continue to lose more weight as the years progress. It's not about only about weight loss and health. It's about why you're doing this. What's your motivation for doing this? Why you have this is for people who want to study and learn and, become, and really become educated in nutritional science. And that's why you do it, because it's tremendously worth it. So what I'm saying here is your brain has a high continual need for antioxidants. That's what prevents dementia. What's, if I ask you the question, what's the food shown in scientific studies to most powerfully protect against dementia, what would you say? Green vegetables, right. And if I ask you, what was the food that showed in scientific study most protected against cancer? The people with the most of these foods have the lowest rate of cancer and the less methylation defects that accumulate cause cancer. What's that food? Green vegetables, right. And the same thing with what foods are most protective against heart disease and associated with, with elasticity of the blood vessels and lack of and prevention of atherosclerosis, plaque, and, and heart attacks and strokes, you would say, green, green vegetables. vegetables, right? Yet these foods are associated with not just lower intelligence, but poor school performance, hyperactivity, attention deficits, 
<laughs> Yet parents are the major problem because the food addicted parents have this thing called cognitive dissonance where they don't want to think what they're doing is bad for themselves. So they just don't ever think that eating donuts and crackers and, are bad for their kids either. So they bring their kids donuts and cheese puffs to the soccer game or to the baseball practice. The kids stood there holding the baseball bat, maybe run around the field for three, three or four minutes, and they're already getting a donut. Wow. So it says parents lower their children's intelligence unknowingly, right? Fresh fruits and vegetables are linked to increased intelligence in childhood. And the fast food consumption is linked to, of course, lower performance, lower economic achievement, lower happiness quotient in life, and no other variable, not poverty, not lack of parents, not abusive parenting, not living in an orphanage, not living with social deprivation, no other variable is as strong linked with crime and drug use compared to eating candy and junk food and fast food in childhood. Candy consumption in childhood has the closest association with criminal behavior in later life and even violent crime. And who's talking about all the suicides and shootings? And who's talking about the food these kids are eating? Nobody. Nobody. And we know that fast food and processed foods and candy is associated with mental illness and, and psychosis. We know that eating junk food has been associated with violence for, for centuries. And half the people that are incarcerated in federal prisons today are there because of non-violent drug-related offenses. And the link between drug, drug use is a subsequent of food addiction. The food addiction turns into alcoholism and drug addiction as the food, as your dopamine receptors in the brain become insensitive, you need stronger things to hit the receptors with more power, and you move on to alcohol and drugs, alcohol more drugs, and then they try to get off their drugs and they go back onto sugar again. So this has been going on for my, most of human history. Oh, hold on, I missed one of that. Oh, there it is. You can't read it in the back, it says, you've got to be insane to eat fast food. If you're not already insane, it makes you insane. Right? So it's amazing the growth, the explosion of insanity and the explosion in mental illness in this country, where a third of our population is taking drugs now for mental, for depression or anxiety or mental illness. It's utterly just astonishing. Where did it come from? And we have the urban poor in vulnerable community called food deserts, which have 50% more high blood pressure, 80% risk of stroke, double the risk of heart attack, triple the risk of having kidney failure. You know, we're talking about these populations. Are they biologically weaker? I mean, it's a form of bigotry and racism because we learn in medical school that black Americans have a high susceptibility to all these diseases, and we're learning it as if some way genetically they're weaker and are more prone to disease. And I showed in my book, Fast Food Genocide, that when Caucasian populations eat the same way, they have the same risk of those diseases. It has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It's the food you're exposed to when, young, when you're young in life. And we're killing people. We're destroying their ability for economic success. We're destroying their ability for happiness. And we're increasing their propensity for drug use and violence because of what their what access to food in these communities. It's been going on for hundreds of years. What's really fascinating and somewhat shocking when scientists try to uncover that figure of years of potential life loss, that YPLL in urban centers, they find that these urban populations where they have so much obesity and diabetes that these obese populate, obese diabetic people have 45 years of life loss compared to suburban populations in Boulder, Colorado where they have more access to fruits and vegetables, for example. 45 years of life loss. We're talking about comparing a lifespan of 90 to a lifespan of 45. Tremendously increased risk of death here. Yet right here I'm talking about is after the Civil War, when black Americans were first freed, because they, a lot of them grew their own gardens and had, and had access to vegetables, there were more centenarians and 
better health compared to the white southerners. It's not to do with the color of your skin. They were achieving economic mobility, economic achievement, pursuing education. And then we had more southern whites eating more of the corn, molasses, and honey, you know, corn, molasses, and meat diet, pork, pork, and they were developing niacin deficiencies, which led to pellagra. In those days, doctors in the medical profession and the health authorities did not know that the insanity and the redneck, the causal neckness, the rash around the neck called the redneck, they didn't know that the delusion and the homicidal and suicidal and violent behavior, they didn't know it was caused by niacin deficiency. Now we know that, that the symptoms of pellagra are anger, violence, homicidal, suicidal behavior. We now know that these denials of deficiency causes the violence and contributed to violence in the South, and the Jim Crow, Crow laws were passed, and lynchings of black people, blacks were driven out of the South and pushed into northern cities. That we learned through history by the 1920s, we learned that this was caused by nutritional deficiencies in white populations. And in those days, in the 1890s and 1910, the doctors were still arguing that it was caused by genetically deficient whites. Back then again, we were, the eugenic movement was blaming it all on genetics, that the dip was causing some people to become excessively violent and, 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 and poor chance of um, intellectual achievement was blamed again on genetics. We're doing the same thing today, right? This has been going on for centuries. <clears throat> That food is the biggest indicator of the ability of any population to succeed and be happy and be economically successful. So the violent back backlash occurred against the black middle class, embracing education and capitalism with exposure to vegetables, and of course, the socially promoted violence, which was intensified by widespread collateral and hookworm, led to violent behavior from nutritionally deficient brains. Nutritionally deficient brains in one their anger and become violent and to react with impulsivity. So this is, Eric Clapton said that sugar was his gateway drug to heroin use, but of course, we know now, of course, a lot of drug addicts go back to sugar again and become very obese. We have a whole, our whole population is addicted to something. Our whole population is like trained from childhood to crave stimulation and to live for excessive stimulation. So they've lost their ability to really enjoy food because it deadens the taste buds, it deadens the smell, it deadens the creativity. It, it's really destroying the potential of our population and leading to such bad decision making. So this is basically irrefutable and accepted by the vast majority of nutritional scientists that as a human species we're designed to function on fruits and vegetables, beans and nuts, and seeds and excessive amounts of animal products. Of course, it's linked to multiple diseases, including cancer. And of course, refined carbohydrates does not just cause diabetes and obesity, but also is linked to breast cancer and prostate cancer and colon cancer. And those processed carbohydrates eaten by so many vegans across America are still riddled with cancer and obesity and serious diseases. Looking at all these overweight people on plant-based diets eating processed carbohydrates with high carbohydrate diets which we'll talk about more tomorrow. So a nutritarian diet is designed to be based on vegetables, not grains, eating a lot of vegetables, including a lot of raw vegetables. And of course, lots of fruit and beans and seeds and nuts. You avoid oils, of course, because they're biologically different. And we'll talk about that more tomorrow. And if animal products are used either extremely sparingly or not at all, and of course, it's based on nutrient-dense calories, particularly those calories that have been proven to show powerful anti-cancer effects, like greens and beans and onions and mushrooms and berries and seeds. We're talking about eating salads with nut and seed-based dressings, not oil and vinegar-based dressings, but nut and seed and vinegar dressings, you know, like tomato sauce, or roasted or, or sun-dried tomatoes that have been soaked and whipped, whipped with some roasted garlic with some balsamic vinegar or fig vinegar with a little bit with a little raisin or make delicious dressings that are taste phenomenal. Made without oil. Most Americans, they throw like three tablespoons of an oil-based dressing on their salad at 120 calories a tablespoon. That's 360 calories of dressing on 40 calories of chopped up vegetables. <laughs> you guys just drink the dressing from the bottle and forget the vegetables. Forget the salad. 
so it's very important to remove the process junk as well. And it's important to consider what we're going to talk about tomorrow, what people could potentially be lacking in, even if their diet is, is completely vegan, or um, what are some issues that vegans, problems that vegans come in could get into. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. And here's a study on 450 people, 443 people on a nutritarian diet, which dropped their systolic blood pressure by 40, by 26 points, more than any other study. And of course, compared to the next most powerful blood pressure lowering diet, the DASH diet, which dropped blood pressure systolic by 11 points, the nutritarian diet got people off their medications, and the blood pressure still went down 26 points. Completely different parameters. And the, di the diabetic research studies are the same thing, where 90% of diabetics became non-diabetic within six months, no longer being diabetic, and their hemoglobin A1C went back to normal again. And just to finish up, I was mentioning earlier that nutritional excellence is not just preventative, it's most therapeutically effective. Here's Jody, who reversed her psoriatic arthritis after being on dangerous medications more than 30 years and, and still having bad psoriasis and bad arthritis, even taking those chemotherapeutic agents that cause cancer. This is an example of what, and here's Teresa, not just with chest pain and heart disease, but with major depression. And nutrition is the most effective therapy for depression as well. We have to give people optimal depression, not just throw drugs at them, so it's recovered from all these people that recover from depression. And the point here is preventing these problems to begin with and giving you the superpowers to put oxygen masks on yourself first. And then we've got to all work together as powerful elements of change in our communities, right, to have people learn about this. Because we've got to work together to change America. Because we're going in the wrong, completely in the wrong direction. And we have to transform America's inner cities into zones of nutritional excellence and give people the foundational philosophy of this country. Isn't it based on equal opportunity and freedom and being able to achieve the, um, being able to, you know, to equal opportunity for advancement? There's no equal opportunity if we don't have access to food, that, that we are eating damaging food that's damaging our brain. So I gave you some information from my new book, Fast Food Genocide, the most recent book which was a book of, of strong interest to me that I spent a lot of time working on, obviously, because there's a lot of information that people have to know about that nobody's talking about. Me. I have 10 other books I've written, six of which have become New York Times bestsellers. Um, but that's my most, my latest book, and of course, my website is drferman.com, which you can see uh, more information about some of, the, some of what I'm talking about here. And nutritionalresearch.org is a non-profit organization that supports nutritional research, and we're doing a nutritional research study department with a Harvard affiliate hospital in Boston on diabetes reversal, and we have a nutri nutritarian research office at Northern Arizona University on, 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 on the faculty there. We have a staff of researchers. We do regular research articles there, and we run the Nutritarian Women's Health Study to show that breast cancer can be prevented and even reversed in its early stages. So I encourage those of you who are pledging to follow or do follow a diet with G-bombs and with protective nutrients to prevent cancer, you can go to nutritionalresearch.org, you can, you can join the Nutritarian Women's Health Study, no charge, no cost, and your data will be collected and protected and be part of like a, an epidemiologic study showing how long you live and, how, and your disease outcomes over your life. So you're being part of the study. We have 3,000 people or 3,000 women already signed up for the study. So if you're a, a, a strong, if you're living and walking the walk and talking the talk and living healthily, go and sign up for that study. And maybe it'll help, and if you're not, by signing up, maybe it'll help teach and motivate you to keep on track to do what you're supposed to do to keep eating healthy. All right, Q&A, do a little Q&A. Yes? Okay, Dr. Kellen, what is your idea of limiting animal products to an older man like me who's been a vegetarian for 60 years? What type of animal products 
if I decide to include any, would I use? Okay, that's a kind. Of, that's an advanced question. So if I answer that, I'm not going to have time for some of the other. Okay, let's go through that a little bit. Here's what we're saying. This is what he's insinuating: is that the common high carbohydrate vegan diets that's advocated by a lot of vegan gurus and mostly carbohydrates are not sufficiently adequate protein for toddlers and the elderly because the, as you get older, not only are toddlers who are retarded their growth because they're not eating enough beans and greens and nuts and seeds, too much rice and potato, and it's like, you know, the, the type of diets I'm talking about, these high carbohydrates, protein restricted vegan diets are okay for the majority of middle-aged people. But when you get to the extent of the extremes of life, you lose the ability to digest protein at the age of 70 or 80 or 90, and the, when you lose that, is proportional to your health. In other words, an average American is going to age faster, and be, when they're 80 years old, they're much biologically older than a person like me is going to be when I'm 80. So when I'm 80, I'm not going to lose biological protein by viability. So, but an average American eating unhealthy will absorb protein less. See, the, one of the advantages of the, the nutritarian diet designed the way it's designed to be richer in protein, to include some nuts and seeds with each meal, if those nuts and seeds facilitate the absorption of the phytochemicals, it balances out the amino acids, so it makes it more protein favorable for, the, for the, those extremes of life. So whereas nutritarian, and keep in mind the foundational fathers that Mark Epstein was talking about of the natural hygiene movement advocated a diet high with nuts and seeds and greens and beans and, and, and a lot of raw foods. They didn't advocate a diet of cooked starch, like a macrobiotic diet of mostly potato and rice, which puts you amino acid deficient and fatty acid deficient for the brain. And, and, and it's, so you follow what I'm saying? So the, the protein needs are already adequately cared for because the design of the nutritarian diet has more protein bioavailability than what's more, you know, some of these more common high starch vegan diets where people are eating more carbohydrate foods and not eating enough greens and not eating enough nuts and seeds. There's, another, there's other reasons why we'll talk about tomorrow why that short slice but it gets to the part of the part of your question. There are also, we're considering that people are not all carbon copies of each other. There are some people biologically whose IGF-1 can get way high with animal protein and other people as they age, their IGF-1 could get dangerously low from not eating animal protein. And even on a vegan diet, as they age, they could drop their IGF-1 becoming too frail and it could increase the risk of stroke and cancer. And there are some cases where people need some animal protein in their diet as they age to prevent the IGF-1 from getting too low. But that's not common in a person that's living healthy for years and years and years. It's happening, it happens to some people. Right, so there can be people that happens to. The point we're making, that I'm making right now is that we have a primary responsibility to do what's right for this person, for their optimal health and longevity, and not let some philosophical viewpoint and, and rigidity make us behave in an irresponsible fashion to hurt some person. And that's what the majority of these vegan gurus that are favoring the vegan community are doing. They're completely irresponsible, because it's not about what's best for a person. It's what's best for their, what their legacy, their egos, and the claims they're making that don't apply to all people. So we'll talk about that more tomorrow. You asked it, I had to answer it, but that's what we're talking about that more tomorrow. You guys okay with that? Sure. Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, the person lives in Alaska, Northern Florida. Had, had, should they change the diet in a cold weather climate as opposed to a warm weather climate? climate? Well, here's, I'm talking about that tomorrow more. It's more about tomorrow's subject. Because we're saying here is that when we moderately undershoot calories by a little bit, it slows down the metabolic rate. And you need a slower metabolic rate to live longer. If you want to live to 100 years old, then you want your body temperature to be lower. See, when I eat less calories, I'm not going to get too thin. I'll stop losing at my ideal weight, unless I really undershoot like an anorexic. But moderately undershooting is stop it this way. I don't keep losing. Because my body makes adaptations to control it to, to slow its metabolic rate down. And those adaptations it makes to slow its metabolic rate down are slowing the aging process down. They can be age slower, and it does so by lowering its body temperature. It does so by lowering its respiratory quotient. You lose less calories breathing. It does so by lowering its thyroid function. But those are, those are significantly indicative of slower aging. So the nutritarian, the natural hygiene 
people who are slim and healthy and eating right, they're going to tolerate the heat better and be more cold in a colder climate. But that's good, not bad. You just got to dress warmer. So when I ski, I wear mittens, not gloves, and I have the heated you know, things in my gloves and the batteries in my mittens and the, in my feet, and I keep myself warm. And I want to be a little colder than other people. I want to have a soul that about me. But good question. You don't want to eat to tolerate the cold climate because that's going to speed up the aging process. You want to use the clothing appropriately to tolerate the cold climate. You want to, you won't, and you'll be to more tolerant to the hotter weather, hot weather, which is great for the climate change. You'll be more tolerant. Everybody else will die off except us. <laughs> okay, yes. What do patients do with I'm sorry, I can't hear your question. Hey, how would you treat it? Well, I'm sorry. I, I, let me not. Uh, why don't I talk to you about that, like over a meal or something, privately, about your individual problem? I don't want to talk about it. So we want, but it is true that in many cases, uh, an excellent diet to get the blood pressure back to normal without medication could prevent AFib. And you should know that the major cause of AFib is medical care. Because when, you take, when your blood pressure is high, and then you take medication to lower the blood pressure, you push your diastolic too low, and the heart refills during diastole. The coronary blood vessels get all their blood refilled during diastole when the heart when the vessels are relaxing. And then, oh, excuse me, I said that wrong. During diastole, the vessels are contracting. During systole, when the heart pumps and explodes, the vessels are expanding. So when the heart, when the, when the peripheral vessels contract inward during diastole, when your when your heart is relaxing, that's when the blood goes back to the heart. So blood pressure medications push down systole at the expense of lower diastole too low, and the heart doesn't refill quick enough during diastole, and the lack of oxygenation causes atrial fibrillation. So the major cause of atrial fibrillation is medical blood pressure medications. And then they get atrial fibrillation, they put you on a, on a blood thinning medication, and that causes now weakened bones and insufficient. Um, Irritation of your esophagus, and propensity to bleed, and then they put you on prothrombin pump inhibitors, which cause osteoporosis, which cause more heart attacks. So, so one drug causes another problem, causes another problem. So, and, but you can reverse all that. You know. so yes. So I just got two emails in my uh, inbox this week about resistant starch in being in high levels in white rice and in white potatoes when you allow them to cool. And I wanted to know if you had heard anything about this. Yeah, this has been around for 20, 30 years. It's not new. It's that if you're, number one, it doesn't make white rice or white potato or low glycine food. Okay. It just improves the resistant starch content. But keep in mind, when you're taking in, you have high glycemic foods, you have moderately glycemic foods, and you have low glycemic foods. How do we make a moderate glycemic food into a low glycemic food? That's the question. How do we make a high glycemic food into a moderate glycemic food? And here's how. Is that when we eat foods that are high in resistant starch, really high, like beans, and when we eat foods that promote the growth of healthy bacteria, like, and there are four foods that are most, are strongest in promoting these healthy bacteria, and they are, these four foods are two raw, two cooked. The raw foods are leafy greens and, and onion scallion. The two cooked foods are mushrooms and cooked beans. They thicken the biofilm that coats the villi in the small intestines, making that now it slows the glucose absorption of all foods you eat. So the combination between having low body fat, which keeps your body very insulin responsive, so the pancreas only has to feed a little bit of insulin to get its work done, so it's having very low body fat, and having the foods that thicken the microbiome, which slow the absorption of glucose in the digestive tract wall, now when I eat the mango or the oatmeal, that moderate glycemic load of foods is a low glycemic load effect, because of my low body fat and because I regularly eat beans and greens and mushrooms and onions. Did you follow that? So this is more about what we're talking about tomorrow, but you're asking me about it today, so I don't think so that's going to go all day early. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm wondering how long would you say it takes for someone who becomes 100% compliant to leave the addiction of SOS? That's a really good question. Because I used to think for like my first 20 years of medical practice that it took three months. That's what I thought for 20 years. When I actually did the study, we found that for some people it took as long as five or six months. Because they didn't get their full taste buds 
to change all the way. They lost their addictive drives, but they still had emotional attachments to their old diet in the three to six month window, and they still didn't get the full ability to enhance their ability to taste food until the five or six months. We got actually trapped it, you know. But, but that's why it's, it's good to really, for a person to really have that three month window of really strict adherence to get rid of the, the propensity of wanting to crave those foods, the real strong cravings, just like the drug addiction model. They put people away the drug addiction centers for three months. Right? They come out, they go back in their drugs, and they kill, they, they kill themselves. Because after they withdraw from their drugs for three months, now they're no longer tolerant to those medications. A little bit of heroin now is going to act like taking 10 times as much. They're going to kill them. No? Okay, one last question. Yes? Uh, over a half the states have now legalized medical marijuana. How detrimental to our species is marijuana? <laughs> you know, so many things we have, such, we have we have a lot of evidence for, and the evidence is not from one study; it's from multiple studies. You know, we have meta-analysis of many studies put together. So we have so much evidence where people can make changes for the better in their, in their life right now. And the whole point is, is live in a manner to avoid the need for medicinal substances. Because we don't know what happens to those medicinal substances. The medicinal property of the plant is the toxic part of the plant, not the nutritive part of the plant. We learned in medical school that the efficacy of a pharmacologic substance is proportional to its toxicity. And it's the toxic part of the plants that, call it, that we use to make drugs out of, not the nutritive part. So whether your drug comes from a naturopath, made from the foxglove plant, or the bark of some you know, rare tree, or whether it comes from a drug industry, if you're looking to modulate the symptom of disease, it's toxic. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>